So our next speaker in this session is going to be Gray Hoffman, who is a doctoral student in my group. And Gray is going to tell you about something that I've wanted to do for many, many years. As we discussed yesterday, we are able to detect many more precursors for peptides and we have time to identify and quantify. And I've always wanted to be able to select proteins and peptides of biological interest from the limited number of proteins that we end up quantifying per cell. Whether that number is 1,000, 2,003, or 4,000, that's still a limited number. So uh, can we make that set of proteins be a protein of biological uh, proteins of biological interest and do that efficiently? So while this seems conceptually very simple, it has taken us many years to do it. And it has been quite challenging. So it took somebody like Gray with a tremendous amount of perseverance and tolerance for all the failures along the way to make that happen. And uh, another thing that I'll quickly mention for Gray before I let him tell you about his journey and uh, what he is currently able to do is that Gray uh, is, exhibits the ultimate team spirit in, in our group. He is the person willing to help anybody with anything, regardless of how, how difficult that is and how much of, of his time it's going to take. So as, as a team member of, of the lab, he's really indispensable for make everything work. Not only the prioritized mass spectrometry, but anything else that we do in the lab uh, requires Gray's help and support. Great, welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, really, really kind. Um, and uh, as, as Professor Salvo mentioned, um, today we're going to be discussing a little bit uh, the results of an ongoing collaboration with the Cox Lab, the creators of MaxQuant Live, uh, aimed at improving our single cell data acquisition methods. Now, the single cell system that we are going to be um, Profiling today is made up of macrophages. I think we may need to troubleshoot the remote um, briefly. So what we're gonna be discussing in today's talk uh, are the results of uh, collaboration with the Cox Lab um, in which we're optimizing our uh, single cell mass spectrometry acquisition methods. And the single cell system that we're gonna be uh, profiling today is made up of macrophages. And macrophages are an enormously diverse uh, member of the innate immune system. They are professional phagocytes. They can respond to cues in their uh, environments to uh, affect various functional phenotypes. So in response to pathogen invasion, uh, they can adopt a pro-inflammatory phenotype. Uh, as they detect pathogen associated molecular patterns uh, via their pattern recognition receptors. Uh, conversely, they can also adopt uh, anti inflammatory properties, uh, such as in the tumor environment or to promote wound healing and angiogenesis. And all of this heterogeneity is really fertile ground uh, for single cell methods, particularly single cell mass spectrometry methods. Since we are acquiring data with single cell mass spectrometry methods, it's uh, worth it to talk about the most commonly used uh, single cell mass spectrometry method, uh, which is shotgun data analysis. Uh, so what we have on the left hand side is a complex sample uh, made up of uh, digested proteins from cell lysate. And we're able to uh, separate the components of this complex mixture via liquid chromatography so that we deliver a much less complex mixture to the mass spectrometer over time. Uh, because if we were to deliver the entirety of that sample to the mass spectrometer at one moment, there'd be too many ions uh, present to identify many of them with, with shotgun methods. So we simplify the mixture uh, and serially inject it over time, um, such that the mass spectrometer is able to dedicate more instrument resources to the precursors as they appear. And we have a, a cartoon schematic of uh, how these precursors um, are analyzed by the mass spectrometer. Um, we see uh, exiting the, the, uh, the emitter, uh, a number of uh, precursor ions that are color-coded in red or purple or blue. 
And then we see their mass to charge ratios and intensities uh, in a, a cartoon display of the survey scan. And all these, even though we've simplified the mixture of uh, precursors that are entering the instrument, uh, we still have quite a lot of uh, precursors to choose from. And we got to have some metric, some way to determine which precursors would be the most fruitful ones to send for MS2 analysis for fragmentation and potential identification by downstream search strategies. And by and large, uh, that heuristic is intensity. Uh, so while you can set your mass spectrometer to exclude um, different charge states of ions, so you're biasing your analysis towards peptide-like ions, uh, the main metric that we're using here as to which precursors to send is intensity. And what we see in this uh, schematic of the survey scan are, is a top three method where the top three most abundant precursors are sent for MS2 analysis. And the rest of those that are not color coded in red are not sent for MS2 analysis and may be missed in this uh, particular analysis. Now, there is a drawback to using intensity as your heuristic because intensity, uh, while it may bias you towards success, does not guarantee that you're going to be able to identify that precursor that you sent for MS2 analysis. And what we're showing here is some actual data acquired uh, at Mugar Hall on, on campus. Um, and what we have in red are the number of MS2 scans that we're sending, the number of precursors out of all the precursors that the instrument is detecting that we are going to send for MS2 uh, scans and hopeful identification. And you see that's about 7,500 precursors. Now, of these, we're only confidently identifying just over 2,500. So there's this enormous disjunct between what we're sending and what we're identifying. And if we look at it in terms of a proportion or a fraction of MS2 scans that result in a confident identification, we see that around 37% of these result in a confident identification. So in some ways, this is a tremendous waste of, of instrument resources, of time on the instrument. Uh, and we, are, uh, we and others are, are, are investigating ways to make better use of the instrument time. Uh, we're, this is a long-standing problem, and we're certainly not the first ones uh, to, to consider it. Uh, in 2015, the Gigi Lab released a paper in Nature Biotech uh, indicating just such an issue. Uh, in Erwin Skoos talk, you found uh, evidence of, a, of another method that can make better use of the instrument time using tribrid instruments. Uh, and I believe Christopher Rose will also be speaking to this uh, in his talk later this afternoon. And so there is this enormous need in the single cell community for making better use of the instrument time, particularly given that we fill for much longer for our MS2 scans to acquire more ions for our single cell samples. Now, where's this problem coming from? Uh, we mentioned that intensity is not the ultimate metric of identifiability, and this is for uh, a variety of reasons. You can have an unidentifiable precursor. You can have a precursor that just poorly fragments, even though it's abundant. You can have trips and auto cleavage products or uh, proteinaceous contaminants to all the various enzymes that you use, your benzenase, your, uh, your trips and gold, et cetera. And all of these uh, highly abundant precursors are taking instrument time that might be better spent on biologically interesting targets. Uh, here, I've shown a precursor that has not been selected, MRC1, which is the mannose receptor, which plays a role in uh, macrophage pathogen detection. And a secondary problem that is encountered with shotgun mass spectrometry methods is that the same set of precursors are not identified across all of your experiments, or even from one experiment to the following experiment. And in looking at these two uh, schematics here, we can see that two thirds of the abundant precursors are sent for MS2 in, in two uh, following experiments. But if we acquire data over a number of days across 40 single cell samples, uh, what we're going to find is our data matrix of precursors that are identified and experiments or single cells is going to be uh, very sparse if we uh, employ shotgun methods. And it's going to, uh, we're going to have to use a little bit more imputation than maybe we might want to. And with some changes to the instrument acquisition method, we can reduce the amount of imputation that we might want to do and send precursors for analysis uh, that are identifiable and biologically interesting. So there are existing methods for getting around these problems of consistency of identification, 
um, and of quantitation. And on the right-hand side, uh, we're showing some of these targeted methods, um, selected reaction monitoring, parallel reaction monitoring. These are methods that give you enormous sensitivity uh, through the use of spike in heavy standards. Um, and you can, you can get very, very uh, sensitive relative quantitation with these methods and also sample the same precursors at multiple points over the elution peak. And many of these methods are used uh, up to hundreds of protein targets that they're profiling. At the other end of the spectrum, we have shotgun methods, which afford you much greater coverage, but you are on purpose not sampling the elution peak at multiple points because you're going for deep coverage. And so what we were interested in doing was uh, maybe taking some aspects of both ends of these poles here um, and creating a new, new type of method term, prioritized analysis. We can't demonstrate the sensitivity inherent in the targeted method, so we felt it prudent to use a new term uh, for this type of analysis. And the real aims here are to make more efficient use of the instrument time by sending precursors that are identifiable and biologically interesting, to increase the consistency of identification across a set of experiments. And the grand scheme goal here is to generate an identification and single cell quantitation from every single MS2 scan. That's sort of the grand scheme goal, make the best usage of your instrument time. And our way that we uh, attempted to solve this problem is via the usage uh, building on top of the MaxQuant Live platform. So we have our familiar uh, schematic of shotgun precursor selection on the left-hand side, driven by intensity. And on the right hand side, uh, we have sort of an augmented precursor selection logic, which is familiar to um, mass spectrometrists who've used inclusion based uh, methods. So we're not selecting uh, the most abundant precursors here. Uh, we're selecting them based off of their interest and identifiability to our study. And we, when we encountered the original Max Quant Live um, publication, we were enormously excited about its potential because it would allow us to do just these things. Uh, so we, we've had a long running collaboration uh, with Professor Cox and Christoph, uh, where we've been discussing optimal parameters and uh, implementing features that we thought would allow us to, to solve this problem and to, to make the best use of our analyses. And this is uh, a good display of what we mean by prioritized precursor selection. So we have our familiar schematic on the left hand side. And we have a user-defined priority for these precursor species indicated numerically, uh, which you determine based off of whether it's biologically interesting to your study. Uh, so in this survey scan, those precursor ions denoted with one will be sent preferentially for MS2 analysis and hopefully identified because we pre-screened them to be identifiable. And the medium tier uh, precursor will be sent if there's instrument time. Uh, so that you can increase your coverage if you are not finding your uh, high priority precursors. And then all those other precursors that are not identifiable, even though they may be very abundant, are not sent for MS2 analysis and not occupying your instrument time. And this is a, a sort of an elucidation of the, the workflow, which again will be familiar to uh, mass spectrometrists who have used inclusion list based methods. So you need some way to generate uh, an inclusion list, uh, a list of precursors that you're interested in. You can have a set of DDA analyses of single cell samples. You can have a DIA analysis of uh, carrier and reference material. You could have uh, in silico predictions of retention times and M over Zs for your precursors of interest. As long as you have an M over Z and retention time coordinate for your precursors, you're gonna be able to employ prioritized analysis. And then we recommend using a retention time calibration run on your instrument just to check the accuracy of those retention time estimates. If you're satisfied with the accuracy, uh, you can load your inclusion list into MaxQuant Live once you've defined your uh, priority levels for your peptides of interest. And then if you've chosen the right set of parameters that, that work with your instrument and your sample, uh, you can move on to biological analysis. So this is an encapsulation of the prioritization workflow. But we may want to spend a minute to talk about the sample prep workflow that generated the samples we're going to examine today because all of the uh, uh, samples that we're gonna look at were generated from single cell sets. Um, and so we're very fortunate in the Slavov lab to have access to a cell in one. And we're extremely fortunate uh, to, to be working with Andrew LeDuc, uh, who is one of the foremost operators of, of the cell in one and has generated this uh, in pop workflow, a slide based prep for single cell sample preparation, which minimizes background contaminants. Uh, so all of these samples were prepared on the cell in one platform using the in pop workflow. 
And then they were uh, constructed using the, the scope two methodology in which you have an isobarically labeled carrier and reference sample uh, alongside your uh, single cell samples. And what we have in the, uh, the diagram on the right-hand side is the same, more simplified version of the schematic that we looked at earlier, where you have a precursor of interest that's isolated and it contains uh, precursor ions from your carrier reference and single cell samples. And then this sample generates, or this precursor when fragmented, generates peptide fragments of which most of the fragments are coming from your, your carrier sample. And then reporter ions in the low mass to charge range, which allow you to do relative quantitation. And there are numerous uh, considerations as you do a scope two uh, style of prep. Uh, and some of these are related to your carrier composition uh, and your instrument parameters. So we're briefly just going to, to discuss um, some of these considerations. Um, so it's been acknowledged by several labs that uh, how you construct your carrier is not a trivial matter. Um, and you need to balance this with your instrument parameters that you're using for acquisition. So as you increase the size of your carrier sample to from 100 cells to 200 cells up to 1,000 cells, uh, this can have impacts on uh, your single cell quantitation if you do not adjust your instrument parameters uh, such that you allow for the full fill time of your MS2 scans to complete. You might be uh, triggering the scan to complete early, uh, and by not collecting enough ions from your single cell samples, you're gonna have a negative impact on your single cell quantitation. So this is a consideration that we dealt with as well. And for this set of experiments, we went with uh, a 200 cell carrier uh, and we uh, set our, our AGC threshold such that we filled for the entirety of our 500 millisecond MS2 scan to kind of uh, ensure that we we're getting good single cell quantitation. Uh, so this is, uh, Notably, a, a consideration that was identified by Chris Rose uh, and Erwin Skoof, as well as uh, members of the Slavov lab. So um, it's worth you know, reading these publications to get a sense of um, how one should balance experimental considerations when using a scope two style prep. And now we can move on to a, a quick description of the model system. So we collaborate with the Zanoni lab, uh, who are uh, at Boston Children's Hospital, experts in uh, innate in immunology. They study uh, pathogen receptor um, pathologies or, or signaling. Uh, and uh, all of these single cell samples were, uh, or all of these macrophages were prepared by Marco and Francesco. Uh, so the bone marrow uh, was harvested from mice. It was differentiated into macrophages using macrophage colony stimulating factor over seven days. Uh, and then it was, uh, these macrophages were polarized with LPS for 24 hours or unstimulated as a control. And so this single cell model system is the one that we're gonna be investigating um, once we take a look at our prioritization metrics. Uh, and this was done in such a way that uh, in order to benchmark our prioritization performance, we did 20 um, single cell experiments conducted using typical shotgun style analyses that we would ordinarily use. And then 20 prioritized scope experiments uh, as a useful contrast to benchmark our performance. And this is a readout on how we did, very similar to our uh, benchmarking that we, we looked at earlier. So for shotgun analyses, we're taking around 4,000 MS2 scans. Um, these are slightly uh, less abundant samples. They're primary immune cells. And we're identifying about 1,500 of these precursors confidently. Now, when we use prioritized methods, we're taking fewer MS2 scans, but those MS2 scans that we're taking are by and large very fruitful. Uh, we're identifying about 2,500 uh, precursors confidently. Um, so that's you know, an increase of 1,000 precursors that you would not necessarily have identified in a single experiment uh, using shotgun methods. And just to, to see this in terms of proportions, um, the prioritized analysis allows you to uh, get confident identifications for about 75% of your MS2 scans, whereas if you use shotgun uh, with these longer fill times, uh, you'll have a uh, identification success rate in, in the realm uh, over 47 per, or over 37 percent. So it is a, a definite increase by using the prioritized analysis. And we talked a little bit about the priority level tiers. Uh, so how did we construct our uh, prioritized list? For those uh, precursors that we were interested in for biological analysis, these were targets that we identified via um, 
uh, contrasts of LPS and unstimulated cells. These were uh, differential proteins that we identified via PCA analysis of just each individual population, and also differential proteins uh, from a functional assay that we conducted at the bulk level um, for phagocytic capacity. The medium tier is just all remaining identifiable precursors. The low tier are high confidence identifications derived from DIA, kind of an orthogonal method here. Uh, and then those that were never sent for MS2, uh, but allow us to uh, kind of get good retention time alignment is the bottom tier here. So that's everything else that we identified in our RT calibration run. And this can give you sort of a qualitative sense of the difference between these two methods. Uh, shotgun is on the left-hand side, prioritized analysis is on the right-hand side of each grouping of columns. And what we see is that across experiments, in prioritized analysis, we have a much more consistent level of identification of the precursors, which are shown on the y-axis. This is primarily um, apparent at the high priority level. Uh, we see some decrease at the medium priority level. And then the low priority level, we're still getting uh, deep coverage of, of many candidates that would not have been sent for MS2 very often by shotgun style analysis. And if we wanna look at this a little more quantitatively, uh, we can see what is the identification success? What percentage of experiments were these precursors successfully and confidently identified in? And shown in red are the uh, prioritized experiments. And we see that the median of the high priority tier is around one. And in close to 100% of uh, the experiments, we identified these high priority uh, precursor species. Whereas the, the median of uh, our shotgun analysis, still very good, is at 75%. Uh, and then we also see uh, supra shotgun performance uh, from the medium priority tier. And then for the low priority tier, uh, we see that we're identifying these precursors in about 37% um, of our experiments, but these allow us, these were not things that were of primary biological interest, but can um, give us additional information about our samples. But because we're interested in single cell proteomics, uh, it's not just important that a precursor generates an identification. If it generates identification, but you don't have any uh, reporter ion quant, uh, it's kind of a useless scan. And in this figure, we're, we're observing the number of precursors that had detectable reporter ion signal per single cell. So per single cell in the shotgun analysis, about a thousand precursors had uh, detectable reporter ion signal. Per single cell in the prioritized analysis, we get an additional 500 precursors that had detectable reporter ion signal. And that's meaningful if those 500 precursors are of interest to your study. Now, we also had the ability with MaxQuant Live to dedicate additional instrument resources to precursors of high biological interest. So you have the, the ability to allocate uh, longer MS2 fill times to precursor species that are more lowly abundant. And on the left-hand side, we see a distribution of precursor intensities for all precursors confidently identified in our shotgun analyses. And for those biologically interesting peptides, if they were in uh, the lower 33% of, of precursor intensities, we could double the MS2 fill time to 1,000 milliseconds. If they were in the middle 33%, we could uh, adjust the MS2 fill time by a factor of 1.5 and collect for 750 milliseconds. And what's the impact of this for these select precursors? That's uh, apparent on the right-hand side. So these are uh, roughly the counts of um, single cells in which these precursors had detectable reporter ion signal in. And we've changed the distribution for the prioritized analysis such that in about 125 cells, uh, or for these precursors, they have detectable reporter ion signal in about 125 cells, whereas in the shotgun analysis in which the MS2 fill time was kept static at 500 milliseconds, um, generally these precursors have a detectable reporter ion signal in about 25 cells. So there is an enormous impact of being able to dedicate additional instrument resources to things you actually care about. Um, then to look at, at the other end uh, of our priority tiers, those precursors that we added to the lowest tier, uh, again, these would be pretty worthless if they didn't generate a reporter ion signal for our single cells. And we find that per cell uh, from this lower tier, we typically get around uh, 375 um, precursors per single cell detected, uh, which is 
quite a nice boost and gives you additional information when um, doing downstream biological analysis. And now we get to the downstream biological analysis. So on the left-hand side, we see a low dimensional representation of all the single cells that were acquired over our 40 single cell sets in both shotgun and prioritized analysis. And we see that principal component one captures about 34% of the variance in the data and roughly corresponds to our treatment conditions. On the left-hand side, those are our LPS stimulated cells. On the right-hand side, those are our untreated cells. But as was discussed in both Professor Slavov and Andrew LeDuc's presentation, separation across uh, PC1 or across any principal component is not necessarily validation of the accuracy of your quantification and could be driven by a number of artifacts. So on the right-hand side, we're taking a look at some of these uh, possible contributors to separation. In the top right, we have TMT label. So we've color-coded each single cell by the TMT label used. Uh, and in looking at both the TMT label or the experiment from which these single cells were derived, there really isn't a discernible pattern or clustering for uh, these different color codings. So that gives you a, a bit of confidence that the separation you're observing is not driven by, say, the, the label that was used for that single cell uh, or the experiment that that single cell was identified in or uh, its proteins were quantified in. And another way to, uh, to benchmark the accuracy of your quantitation is to try and compare the quantitation in your single cells to the closest thing that you have to the ground truth. And our closest approximation of the ground truth is to uh, profile bulk samples. Uh, because they're more abundant, they'll generate more uh, fragments, uh, and we'll be able to um, have a better idea, a better contrast um, in terms of their relative abundances. So what we have on the x-axis is exactly the ratio of our LPS-treated sample in bulk to our uh, untreated sample in bulk in the same TMT set. So these samples are combined in the same TMT set, and then we take the precursor ratios for the LPS and untreated conditions. Now, in order to uh, get something comparable from the single cells, we have to create a bulk portrait. So we have a number of single cells that were exposed to LPS for 24 hours and also their untreated counterparts. Uh, we take their average precursor abundance across the uh, relative abundances that we have for those precursors uh, for the LPS and untreated. And in that way, we have uh, a comparable uh, measurement, uh, sort of a comparable uh, in silico bulk portrait that we can compare to um, the bulk analyses that we've done. And in comparing these vectors, we see that we have uh, a correlation, Pearson correlation of about 0.62, uh, which is relatively high. So that gives us uh, a degree of faith in our single cell measurements that we're making and that they're not driven by, by artifacts. And if we look across uh, principal component one, if we look at our two cell types and we uh, are interested in doing protein set enrichment, looking for uh, coordinated uh, sets of proteins that are upregulated in one condition or the other, we see some reassuring trends. Now, you could do this with bulk analyses. Uh, there's no reason why you couldn't bulk profile the LPS and untreated samples, but this is sort of a good uh, sanity check to ensure that the trends that you would observe from those bulk samples are also present in your single cells. So for the LPS stimulated condition, we see uh, upregulation in protein kinase C signaling, we see interferon beta response. We see interferon gamma response. Uh, we see positive regulation of nitric oxide biosynthesis. And reassuringly, we also see uh, LPS response in our LPS treated cells. Uh, so this is good uh, validation uh, across our con conditions. But we can do quite a bit more. Uh, we can do something that would not be possible with bulk level analyses. And that's to zoom in on each condition separately. If you don't have a worthwhile way or a uh, practical way of sorting uh, subpopulations of these cells, um, it's not going to be possible to contrast them using bulk analyses. So what have we done? We did a low, represent, uh, low dimensional representation of just our LPS stimulated cells shown on the left. And then we looked across the uh, principal component that captures the greatest amount of variance in the data, 14% here. And we did uh, protein set enrichment across this axis, across the origin, since this contains most of the variance in the data. We're asking the question, is this separation uh, driven by uh, concerted uh, abundances in protein sets? 
And those protein sets that um, were differentially abundant uh, across this axis are quite interesting. So we have uh, the polycomb group complex, which is involved in chromatin remodeling and has been linked to uh, macrophage plasticity in a, in a quick response to a stimulus. Uh, we have the ARP23 actin nucleation pathway, uh, which is involved in sensing dynamics uh, in terms of the extracellular matrix in fibronectin haptotaxis and also in um, phagocytosis of opsonized pathogens. So there is some functional, uh, functionally interesting uh, annotation to some of these GO terms. We also have glucose binding, um, G protein couple receptor binding, and some zinc finger domain binding, which has been implicated in inflammation. Now for our untreated cells in which the same sort of analysis was uh, performed, we also see some very interesting uh, enriched protein sets that are, that are uh, significantly differential. Uh, so we see there are differences in the clathrin code assembly which uh, are related to endocytosis or endocytic ability. Uh, so many of the, the hits in the, in the clathrin code assembly were promoters, or sorry, not promoters, but adapter proteins um, that relate to the formation of uh, um, uh, endocytic pits. Uh, we have fatty acid binding. And then for metalloexopeptidase activity, we detected about four aminopeptidases across all our single cells uh, that are upregulated in those untreated cells on the left-hand side of principal component one. So there are concerted differences uh, in these aminopeptidases. And we also detect differences in scavenger receptor activity or in the abundance of scavenger receptor type one and two across principal component one. And these are just a subset of the um, protein sets that were differentially abundant across principal component one. Now, in our collaboration with uh, the Zanoni lab, we also had the opportunity to uh, do a functional assay on these different cell types. So uh, dextrin can be used as a, uh, a way to ascertain phagocytic capacity or endocytic capacity or macropenocytic capacity, depending on the molecular weight of dextrin that you're using. And then if you fluorescently label it, you can get a fax or flow cytometry-based readout on how endocytic your cell populations were. Uh, and so what was performed here by uh, Marco and Francesco was they incubated the LPS stimulated cells or untreated cells with fluorescently labeled dextrin. The cells uptook the dextrin uh, in differential amounts. They were more or less endocytic. And what, what's on the right-hand side here is uh, just a representation of how they sorted these cells. They took the top and bottom 10%, those with uh, highest phagocytic capacity, those with lowest phagocytic capacity, sorted them separately. And then we perform DIA-based analyses on these different populations to determine uh, differentially abundant proteins. Shown in green are those proteins that are associated with uh, higher phagocytic capacity. So we have siloadhesin, we have stabilin-1, and then the most confidently differential protein is the mannose receptor, which makes a lot of sense uh, given that they were being exposed to dextrin. Uh, the mannose receptor is also involved uh, as a pathogen recognition receptor for uh, mycobacteria. So it's of biological interest as well. And then if we think about these upregulated proteins as a protein set that we've identified via bulk methods, we can then ask questions of the single cells. We can look at uh, the median abundance of this endocytic capacity set or for high endocytic capacity set in our single cells and correlate that to the, the principal components to see is there an axis of separation uh, that might be well correlated to endocytic capacity. And in doing this, we were able to identify principal component six and principal component two as that axis of separation. And then we can do a similar analysis to what was done previously, looking across principal component six to see if there are other concerted um, protein sets that would be well correlated with endocytic capacity. And that's what, what we're showing here. So these are uh, significantly differential protein sets uh, in either those cells that had less uh, endocytic capacity, which we defined as low dextrin uptake, or those single cells that would have higher endocytic capacity, which is indicated here with high dextrin uptake. Um, and we find a number of very interesting um, protein sets that are enriched. We see uh, protein, ki protein kinase C uh, activating G protein coupled receptor. We have upregulation in cytokine secretion. 
Uh, we have glucose transport and uh, fatty acid binding. And we also have upregulation of NF-kappa beta activity. And we do see some of these that are differential across the uh, axis of principal component six. So what we've been able to do with prioritized analysis by um, collecting uh, those precursors that are of biological import uh, for each subpopulation uh, across condition, and then those that are related to our functional assay, is we've been able to ask some very interesting questions uh, of our single cell samples. We've been able to look at functional heterogeneity within the single cell populations in a way that would not be possible from bulk analysis. So just to wrap up before we um, take some questions, in terms of the methodology, uh, we've demonstrated much deeper coverage uh, or much increased coverage of the prioritized analysis uh, when we contrast it to shotgun analysis, about twofold. Uh, we've been able to increase the consistency of identification in a priority dependent manner. And we've enabled longer, uh, in using MaxQuant Live, we've been able to dedicate longer fill times for high priority peptides, uh, increasing their quantitative accuracy in the single cells. Uh, and then I, I just summarized this finding on the, on the last slide, but we've been able to um, identify functional heterogeneity in our single cell samples in a way that would not have been previously possible. Um, so with that, um, got a lot of people uh, who are involved in this project who I'd like to thank. Um, so uh, we have the, um, the Cox lab, uh, Professor Jurgen Cox and, and Christoph, who we've been actively collaborating with to optimize these analyses. Um, David Perlman from Merck, who we've been, you know, had a lot of discussions uh, regarding this targeted application, how to optimize it. Um, the uh, Zanoni Lab, Boston Children's Hospital, uh, Professor Ivan Zanoni, Francesco Borriello, and Marco de Goya, um, who have been really active in our uh, immunological discussions and also have prepared all of the, the, the single cells, uh, you know, differentiated and polarized our macrophages uh, to kind of. Uh, give us a platform to, to demonstrate prioritization. Um, and I'd also like to thank all the members of the Slavov lab. Um, you know, it's a very active lab. We uh, meet very regularly in uh, small groups and also uh, in our weekly group meetings uh, to discuss our findings. And so a lot of what you see here is the product of these, these active discussions. Um, and I'd also like to make sure to uh, give a, a very big thank you to Andrew LeDuc, uh, who facilitated, who was instrumental in preparing the samples for this analysis. Um, and thank you all for your attention uh, during this presentation. Thank you, Bray. So as Thank you, Gray. As you can see, there are a few questions here and the Wi-Fi went down again for some reason. So I'm going to use the questions from the local area network. Uh, the first question is whether you're performing this analysis using QExactive Q Classic system. Yes, absolutely. All of these um, experiments were analyzed on the QExactive. And the approach is fully compatible with any other uh, QExactive system with a tribert, with Eclipse, uh, all of the uh, Orbitrap systems work, and we are very interested in extending this to work on Kim stuff as well. Uh, so then there is a question from Claudia. Uh, she is saying, really cool talk, thanks. And she is wondering whether real-time retention time alignment as performed by the recently released work from, uh, from uh, Mike McCoss's lab can also work for this type of analysis. Uh, so I haven't personally explored um, the platform from the Lacoste lab, so I'm not in a good position to, to contrast these two. So Claudia, we started this project a few years before the work from Mike's lab was released. So in principle, uh, their approach might also be usable, though I suspect it may not have the prioritized tiers and many of the features that we specifically built in for single cell analysis, but it's, it's, it's software that goes in the same direction. Um, okay, so to diversify, there, is a, there are questions from the audience. Yeah, your great talk. I really appreciate, you know, you try to use instrument and uh, two questions. You build up the libraries from the bulk data. That's what you've been using, correct? Uh, uh, for so, the prioritizing uh, type of decisions, right? Yeah, so we have, um, in order to determine which were the biologically interesting uh, precursors, we did some bulk analyses. We also did some um, single cell analyses. 
Um, and all of these methods uh, informed our decisions about which precursors are biologically interesting. But for the uh, retention time alignment, we just in injected a carrier reference sample and performed uh, DIA analysis of it to get very accurate retention times of our uh, carrier sample. Okay, yeah, then, then just to comment on that, you did prioritize a different type of peptides by uh, their kind of usability rate. And then just looking at the 1500 proteins, you can simply take three peptides per protein, that would be 4,500 proteins, and use all of them for one second. That would be 75 minutes of the gradient. You will be just doing all of them with one second. There is no prioritization. It's just simple targeted run. It's been revealed last year as a screen platform, and it's just doing the same job, just what what's the caveat of catching up certain peptides with the smaller uh, kind of accumulation time and certain peptides with the larger accumulation time, if you can allow just all of them to be accumulated for one second? Uh, so, I mean, that that is, uh, I think, a really good observation. Um, although some of these precursors may not need a full um, second of analysis to be identified and well quantified. So we, in order to get greater throughput, we just acquire them for 500 milliseconds and then just dedicate the instrument resources to those precursors that would benefit from it. That was a beautiful talk. Um, how would you think that prioritization would differ if you were to profile a cell type heterogeneous population where you have a lot of different cell types and you may um, have to, especially if they're found at different proportions in your population? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so in this particular analysis, we did have uh, just two different treatment conditions. So if you're analyzing something that was a lot more complex, uh, you might want to do a lot more assays up front to figure out um, what the biologically interesting protein sets were uh, for your analysis. And then uh, determining how to balance your carrier composition um, to include uh, those, I guess, more rare elements of your population is something that we did not necessarily have to deal with here, but will be a concern if you have a very, very heterogeneous sample. Um. Hi, great, excellent talk. Thanks. Um, so uh, you're, you clearly showed data that with prioritization, your identification rate improves dramatically mm -hmm. over shotgun. Um, uh, but you're setting your bar actually rather high by trying to um, identify those peptides from scratch again. Have you had the opportunity to um, facilitate identification by, for example, making spectral libraries from the um, the carriers that you've used to develop the prioritization list or other techniques that might um, use more rely on the a priori knowledge that you already have about the sample? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we uh, have injected um, higher input amounts of our carrier and reference sample uh, to analyze by DIA analysis. So maybe a 5x version of what we would typically inject with a single cell set. Uh, we build a library from these identifications. And then when we do our uh, retention time calibration run, we search it with this library. And that will definitely facilitate um, uh, more identifications in that small sample that you can then put on the lower tier. Um, and also it will facilitate uh, better retention time accuracy for all your tiers because that's where you're deriving your retention times from. Um, so that's a key just, approach. Just to add to what Gray said, we already have very accurate and precise estimates for the retention time to use to target the apex of the illusion peaks. And Gray here distinguished PSMs based on confidence just on spectra or not confident, but we know that if we take all of the PSMs and feed them through Dart AD, which uses a Bayesian framework to incorporate the retention time, then essentially all PSMs become very confident and are correct at 1% FDR. So you're absolutely correct. So Gray always uses the Atmos trigger and transparency in just presenting the PSMs using the, the hardest, the highest bar he can, he can lift for himself. It's very characteristic of Gray. So we are a little bit over time here. We started delayed and there are more questions uh, that uh, we can certainly um, answer, but I don't want to keep the audience away from lunch, which has been served upstairs. So if you'd like to go for lunch, please feel free to go upstairs and enjoy lunch. Uh, and then for those of you in the in-person or the virtual audience who want to finish the, the remaining questions, perhaps we can spend a few more minutes on that. Sounds great.
Uh, so there is another question, interesting talk, a few questions. If prioritized single cell proteomics can be compared with scheduled PRM, what could be the loop count here? Is there a threshold on how many coiluting precursors can be allowed for optimum performance? So the, the loop count or the, uh, I guess the duty cycle for our prioritized analysis, um, while we can take up to four precursors to, to analyze per, um, per cycle, uh, it seems like um, on average, we're taking about three precursors uh, per, per cycle um, for this particular set of analyses. And uh, the number of co-eluting precursors that can be allowed for optimal performance. Um, for this set of analysis, I did not you know, use any particular uh, metric to distribute the precursors over the, um, the retention times or to choose which precursors we might use. But if there was something that you were very interested in, lowly abundant receptor, uh, you might want to clear space uh, around it so it can be detected at the MS1 level and, and sent for MS2. And, and, and just one clarification to add when we compare it to PRM and other types of targeted analysis, our intention here has been to analyze many thousands of peptides, which would be very difficult to do with PRM. And in terms of ensuring that there is a set of peptides that always gets analyzed deterministically while still have the high coverage, we use the tiered prioritization where everything that is on the top tier is going to have duty cycle time and be deterministically sent for MS2 scans. While some of the peptides on the lower tier might have a lower probability and, and that's uh, and that reflects our the, the relative importance that we assign to uh, to analyze those peptides based on our biological questions. Uh, is this prioritization suit already available in Max Quant Life for other users? Uh, it is currently not available, but will be uh, released uh, alongside our preprint, uh, which should be coming out fairly soon. Uh, what advantage to use MaxQuant Live over thermal software? Uh, thermal software cannot perform this uh, in terms of, yeah, cannot do the real time alignment and many of the other things that, that we do. Uh, just curious, why use principal component analysis instead of TSNI or UMAP? Uh, I think we, uh, we're working with a, a lower number of single cells in this particular analysis, uh, whereas some of these other uh, metrics benefit from having many more single cell samples uh, uh, when, when they're used for display. It's a, a big part of it is really my preference. There are no fudge parameters. We know fraction of variance explained. And if we are able to see something on PCA, I have much more confidence in seeing the same thing on TSNI. So I, I find it more convincing. It's totally my influence here. I can pass. Um, and then there is a clarification by Andrew.